Hey, and welcome to today's RTS Futures, the ultimate guide to getting a job in television. I'm Alex, I'm the RTS Futures Chair, and I'm here to welcome you and give you a little bit of information before we get started. So today's session uh, will cover four topics, uh, the first of which, uh, ED, is going to give you some information on writing CVs. And secondly, Daniel's going to give you some information on applying to schemes. We've got the lovely Lauren doing a section on interviews. And then our fourth and final section will be general top tips and words of wisdom, including some words of wisdom from Natalie and Fiona, who've got many years of experience uh, in the industry. So without further ado, I'll let them come on and give you some information. I wish you all the best in finding your job. And also just to let you know that all the different sections will be time stamped uh, along, along the bottom. So you can always focus in on that if you need to. Thanks for stopping by and I hope you enjoy the session. Hi, I'm Edie Smokum and I am Managing Director of a company called Think Bigger and we do lots of recruitment across the board for the Channel 4 Production Training Scheme, for the PAC Scheme and a few other uh, things. So we think we're a bit expert in getting a, your CV right, particularly if you're a new entrant. So what RTS Futures has asked me to do is to do a bit of a um, sort of roundup of how to do a really great CV. So this is what I'm going to do for you. So in the first instance, I'm going to share my screen fully with you. Um, this is about the purpose of a CV and why CV is kind of what our currency is in film and television. So the aim of a CV is to get a clear and positive account of what you have to offer. So the first thing it should do is say, why am I going to be hiring you? What is good about you and why I need to, um, why you're the only person for the job? It's to get you to an interview. So, you know, we never in television ask to see you without seeing a CV first. So it's always the thing to get you in the door at an interview. And finally, it's to present a professional document that continues to sell you after you've attended the interview. And that's really important because I've never sat in a meeting yet where we've interviewed people, where we then didn't go back and look at people's individual CVs and compare them. So it's really important that your CV stands for you once you've left an interview. Style and content, really simple. Your CV should take up to two full pages if possible, but never be embarrassed if you're a new entrant. One page is absolutely fine and no one is going to ring you up and say they'd like to read three more pages of your CV. So if it is one page, that's absolutely fine. Don't worry about that. Always stress your achievements and skills. You know, what you've done, what you've done really well. People in film and television really need to get to know you. They hire you because of you. They think about how you might be with contributors. They think about how you might be with the rest of the team. They think about how you might be as a runner on set or location. So as much as possible, information about you personally through your achievements and skills is really important. Always quantify where you can, including examples and figures. You know, you did um, you know, 22 um, sort of hours at Glastonbury as, you know, um, as somebody who picked up litter or, you know, you um, managed to find four free locations for your student film. It doesn't matter, but examples and figures are really, really important. Always get your key messages across quickly and strongly at the very beginning of your CV. Lots of talent managers who read CVs only get through the first half page of your CV. They don't read any further than that. So it's really important that the first half page is as strong as you possibly can. Omit irrelevant da data. If it's not got anything to do with what you're actually doing at the moment, then don't worry about it. Don't include it in your CV. I don't need to know everything about you. And keep the presentation simple. There's a real thing at the moment for everybody to have Canva um, CVs or InDesign CVs, but we've seen them all. We've seen all the templates and the templates just come back. The other thing about templates that I personally don't like is that I feel like you're always going to have to change your CV. You're going to have to tweak it a bit depending on the job and to put your best foot forward. And if you keep the presentation simple, it's really easy for you to make those changes. If you do in a template and you add something in and something else moves and you can't figure it out, or you're going to take two days to get back to me because you have to get back to your parents' Canva because they've got it and you haven't, um, it just delays things. So the more simple it is and nice it is, the better I like it. Some good do's, because I try really hard not to sort of be very, you know, sort of, um, uh, 
you know, I, I try not to say it has to exactly look like this. So some good do's. Tell me who you are and what you want to do. So right at the top, tell me that you're Joe Bloggs and you want to be a runner. Make it easy for me to read your CV. Quite often, because we are based in the West, we read left to right, and it means when we skim read down the left-hand side of the page. So always make sure that if I just quickly run my eye down the left-hand side of your page, it's all very clear, and it sort of falls in a nice chronological order. Always summarize your key strengths and experience. I just want to know what's good about you. And tell me the story of your career. I don't mind if you just left university. I don't mind if you've worked in hospitality or at a call center. I just want to know what that story is. And now you're looking for work in film and television. Always check your grammar and spelling again and again. No matter what happens, you know, send it to other people. Don't rely on spell check. Make sure that I've you know, that you absolutely giving your, yourself the best chance of getting a job. Get some advice or feedback from a friend or colleague. Don't send it out to 50 people, but just really people that you trust and just get some feedback on it. Always keep editing it. You know, I can always tell somebody who hasn't edited their CV and hasn't set it, sent their CV to me filleted. And the reason I can tell is that they'll have, um, you know, a credit at the top or a work at the top. The next one will be this long. And then suddenly there'll be one that, that's this paragraph from three years ago when they had lots of time to do their CV. Always make sure you're making things further down in your CV less important. You know, the key things I'm going to be looking at are the first couple of things in your CV. That first half page, I can't begin to tell you how important it is. Adapt it for different jobs and companies. You know, people are looking for very different things. You know, what one television company will want and the programs that they make which should really tell you how to actually pitch your CV towards them. Some people are more interested in contributors and casting. You know, if that's what they're looking for, lean towards that. If they're looking for somebody who's an office runner, lean towards that. If they're looking for somebody with good organizational skills, make sure that all of your examples talk about your organization skills. Show off whatever you do mention any awards that you've got if you've won a rts student award then mention that if you were you know one of the top students at your university or your school mention those make it easy for me to cite to find your cv and this is really important a number of people that's you know send me their cv and it's you know latest cv or final cv don't just save it as you know your first name your last name your runner and when this month is, so at the moment, I wouldn't put December 22, I would put sort of May 23. And that's because if I keep it on file for four months or five months, I'll know when the last time is that, you know, that that CV was updated. Always be persistent. You know, people get jobs because they keep coming back to people and eventually people remember. Um, so, you know, don't be a stalker. So don't, you know, talk to me every day, but every couple of weeks, you know, or every month, send me your CV and let me know what you've got up to and that you're really still interested in getting into the television industry. Always send updates with new credits. So if you've gone out and done something, you know, send me a nice note saying, hi, Edie, I hope you're well. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I've been working on a couple of shorts and I've updated my CV. Please find it attached. I think the other thing that people forget to do is that they don't expect people to call. It's really important if you sent me your CV with your phone number and I like you, I'm just going to pick up the phone to you and say, would you mind coming in for a chat or do you have time for a chat or what's your availability like? So don't send out 50 CVs, then go on a month long sort of trek around Europe. It doesn't work like that. You need to make sure that you're sending your CV off and that you're going to be around and answering your phone. Don't follow the first hurdle. Make sure that you don't have any silly email addresses. I quite like first name, last name at, you know, gmail.com or whatever. So make sure that, you know, you're not giving anything away in that email address that um, is going to make me judge you. Uh, don't confuse me. Tell me whether you're a runner, a camera trainee or a series producer. It doesn't matter what you are, but just be really clear under your name that you've got that up there. Uh, try not to use complicated format formatting or layouts for the reasons I explained earlier. Um, don't leave out any unexplained gaps in your career. So if you went traveling for a year, tell me you went traveling for a year. I don't mind. If you took time off because you looked after a relative, that's absolutely fine as well. And if you yeah. had some health issues, don't be afraid of actually adding those as well. Um, don't use a, follow, a, a smaller font size to squeeze information in. That's just insane. OK, um, I can tell what you're doing and it just doesn't look good. Um, always give contact details for referees unless and, and, you know, make sure that you're using referees that are going to give you a glowing report. It's really difficult for university students quite, quite 
often are looking for work, work in May and June, and they give academic references. The problem with that is that your, um, you know, your lecturer may have gone off for the summer, or they may not be answering their emails, and then I won't get a hold of them. So make sure that you're actually um, getting people, you know, to, you know, to know that they're going to be a referee for you and that they are going to be around. And don't waste my time by applying for a job that you're under or overqualified for. It's really important that you know where to land in the industry. And there's lots of really great places to find that out. So make sure that you're applying for things that you're going to be competitive for. There's no point sending out 100 CVs to places that, you know, you're not competitive for. You know, make sure that you're sending out five great CVs for the places that you are and the jobs that you are competitive for. So my style guide to the basic layout is, first of all, you know, your name, your contact details, put those right up top so I can easily find you. A profile paragraph if needed, and sometimes I don't think they are needed, but whatever you do, make them short and sharp. Um, career history, always use credits. If you've got credits in the industry, use the term credits rather than previous employment. If you've got on top of that previous employment or relevant employment that is worth you uh, adding, then please add that in. And don't forget, there's lots of very good transferable skills in hospitality, in call centers, in retail, in caring responsibilities. It shows all sorts of things about you, including the fact that you can make phone calls in crowded rooms, that you've dealt with members of the public, that you have you know, worked in busy environments like retail. So you know, don't, don't forget those things, they're quite important. Then any education, training and qualifications, we want that after all of your work experience, because in television, we are really concerned um, mostly about what you've, you know, what work you've done. So then put your education, training, and qualifications, and then you can add any interest and achievements if it's needed and relevant. So if you think, oh, actually, I'm, you know, I'm, um, uh, you know, been training as a dancer for a few years and I really want to work for Strictly Come Dancing, this is a great place to tell us that. Um, you know, I had a former trainee that was a, a musical fanatic and, you know, she put that, she'd, you know, um, done a lot of work in, um, in musicals and put that there because I eventually got her a job working on Mamma Mia, the show. So, you know, that's really worth doing. And then last but not least, put your references. Now I'm going to deal with each of these things uh, individually, so bear with me. So at the top, my CV would look like Edie Spokum, company director, my mobile number, my email. And it might say that I have bases in London and Birmingham, but I'm willing to travel. It's really important at the moment that we know where you are, because if I look at your CV and I think, oh, I need somebody in Newcastle, but they look like they're in you know, Brighton or they're in Plymouth, I may not go for that. So if you've got a base, and when I mean a base, you've got friends that you can stay with, you've got family somewhere, put that down, okay? Um, it's really important if you happen to have a driver's license that you put that down. If you're 23 and over or 25 and over, put that down. If you've got business insurance, if you own your own car, all of those things are really important and show that you know about television because it's important if you're 25 and over because it helps with company insurance. Um, lots of people under the age of 25 aren't covered by company insurance. Uh, so the, the two key ages for, for that are 23 and 25. Um, I would personally leave out uh, a date of birth. I don't think that's relevant and possibly address. And I, the reason I leave out your address is that I think people can be, you know, just a bit, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to hire you because, you know, you are in West London and I'm in East London or whatever. And you don't need to give that information and take out any details that could cast doubt on the ability to do the job at the drop of the hat. So that's really important that you're going to prove to somebody that actually you are really keen to do this job. If you're going to use a profile paragraph, I always say less is more. You don't have a huge amount of experience, otherwise you wouldn't be you know, taking part in RTS Futures. So, you know, you could use bullet points if you want to, but keep it to three or four lines long. Stick to the facts, but don't tell me what then appears in your CV. So, you know, you can absolutely say that you recently graduated from university and you're currently working, looking for your first you know, job in television, that's absolutely fine. Um, don't state the obvious. I think if I had um, Tempe for every time that somebody told me that they were a committed, enthusiastic and a passionate team player, um, I'd be a very rich woman by now. So, you know, this is a given in, in television that you're those things. So think about those things that actually are different about you that would be really useful for a television company. Um, 
a profile paragraph is not set in stone. So just emphasize the skills and qualities that you believe would be important to a particular employer. If you are really good at picking up technical things, if you, you know, have taught yourself editing software, that's probably really important to me. If you're really good at social media, tell me that. You know, if you've done a TikTok that, you know, got millions of viewers, let me know that. That's a really good place to let me know about it in the profile paragraph. Always make sure that it's your key strengths and experiences. You know, tell me a bit about yourself. So, you know, I know what I'm, you know, I'm looking to hire and try to make sure it resembles the person they're looking for. You know, what is this, you know, what is this in this ad? How do I change this profile paragraph? If you've had any career changes, this is a really good place to, to put them. If you're somebody that, you know, only arrived at wanting to work in television after a degree in sociology or a degree in political science. And, you know, this is a good place to say, you know, the reason I now want to work in television is because I did X and, you know, now I'm really keen on television because I had this experience or that experience. If you've worked in other genres, so if you've, you know, made your start in television already and you've been in factual entertainment or, you know, you, you would really like to work on studio shows, you'd really like to work on the big, um, you know, programs like Britain's Got Talent or Strictly or any of those, and that's what really motivates you, then tell people that. If you want to work in, you know, hard hitting documentaries, put that there. It's a really good place to talk about genre because it's, you know, it's representing you and will get your foot in the door more easily. If you have any credits, do put them down, just really carefully put the role. So if you were a runner, if you were a runner on a Great British Bake Off, put the head of department, if there's a head of department there, who broadcast it, who the streamer was, or any sort of um, transmission or release dates. We only want them to look really, really simple, okay? We're, we're quite simple in television. We're gonna read through them very quickly. If you want, give a brief, brief description of the role, three bullet points, what you did. So, you know, I managed uh, the audience. Uh, I looked after uh, making sure that everybody got their lunches. You know, I distributed the call sheets. It doesn't matter. Just put, you know, three bullet points that you, you did. And, you know, ensure that you're demonstrating what your skills and contributions are. People forget that actually being, you know, um, a runner is a really important job and that you, you know, you've met everybody in the cast and crew and you helped out the camera department or whatever. Something that makes you, you know, stand out is really important there. If you're in the craft or tech departments, look up how agents or diary services do CVs. It's really important to follow those. Relevant employment, which if you don't have any credits, you know, to mean will, um, you know, will replace what you've got as credits. But relevant employment is really important, as I said earlier, particularly if you've worked in any of those public facing roles. So just include your previous employer's name and dates. I'm sorry, my dog is barking. Um, put a job title in and only include historical data if it's relevant and it relates to the current career. And, you know, it's really good to use anything that you've done previously to demonstrate how versatile and adaptable you are. I once interviewed somebody who I absolutely gave a job as a, a trainee production coordinator because I asked her how, you know, in the interview, um, how... Uh, if she had any examples of how she could multitask or, you know, deal with stressful situations where there was lots of uh, priorities um, that were competing for each other. And she said, well, I, you know, I was a floor manager at H&M at Christmas time. Do you, you know, what sort of things were you talking about? And that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, you've looked at what you've done and you know how that, you know, how that um translates into television and and that's really important for things like you know if you've worked in a bar and you're responsible for closing it up it shows that you were given responsible tasks and that you completed those you can always lose relevant employment when you've got enough credits so you know just two or three things in there is really helpful you know don't worry if you don't have a lot of them but it's it's a really useful thing to have Education, training and qualifications. Only use the highest level of education you've achieved. We don't need to know your GCSE results or, you know, to mean anything, you know, you're, you know, anything below that. So if you were at university, put that down. If you've done a master's, put that down. If you've done A-levels, that's absolutely fine. Um, it's really important if you have any professional qualifications relevant to the work. So if you are at a university that has a, an Adobe suite and you've done some Adobe training, you've got a certificate or a Final Cut Pro training, anything like that, you know, please include that because that's actually quite, you know, quite important. Any kind of team building, presentation skills. You know, if you were um, editor of your student newspaper, if you worked in the student radio um, uh you know, on a, a student radio program or anything like that, just think that's a really good place to put, you know, put down.
Well, we're talking about interest and achievements, which, you know, we're getting to the end of your CV now, but just emphasize interests that say something about you. I want to know if you're outgoing. I want to know if you are daring. I want to, you know, we once hired um, somebody because they'd done a lot of really extraordinary travel over a four year period. And I just thought, well, actually, they're going to be really good at organizing other people's travel. And, and you know, strangely enough, they were and they became a production coordinator. Um, highlight skills that are required of your job, using initiative and having resilience, something that shows that you actually went the extra mile. Try not to use common interests that most people will include, like reading books or, you know, be specific. What books do you like? Films, what directors, you know, which sort of things, you know, what sort of things do you do in your spare time that make me think, ah, actually, this person really, you know, might be useful to us. Um, you know, think about things that you've self-taught, because I think that always shows a lot of initiative in, in television. You know, what sort of creativity do you do? You know, do you produce TikToks? Have you done, you know, do you have a really active Instagram? Think about, you know, those things that might be relevant to television do you work for any charities you know what did you do during covid what sort of you know um support right. networks do you go out and, and pursue uh think about past achievements including editing university magazines as i said earlier theater productions debating anything like that we're really keen on we really want to know what you you know how you've gone out and got those things Use really good words in your, you know, what I call good selling words in your CV, you know, words like overcame, achieved, applied, you know, I presented, I contributed, I improved, I organized. Don't use the same words all the time, particularly verbs, you know what I mean? I look through CVs and I think, gosh, this person is selling themselves as, as a creative and actually their CV is really boring because they use the same words over again. So try to use words that, you know, show that you're actually, you know, have leadership skills and that you um, you know your contribution to things. You know, using words like quickly, decisively, successfully, competently, you know, I rapidly or enthusiastically, carefully, capably, um, all really good words to use in your CV. References, really important. Try, try, try to avoid stating references are available on request. Try to think of two really good people, because if you do that, it adds another phone call to the list. And, you know, whoever's hiring you may choose someone who has the references already included to save time. And everybody wants information at their fingertips. You know, if you think about it, you know, you should be able to say, um, you know, a really good academic reference and a really good employment reference, you know, even if that's a part time job, just try to get two people that are happy um, to give you references. Always make sure they're going to say the right things. And how I tell, um, you know, people that I talk to about how to do this is if you're really up for a good job and you really want the job, email them with your CV, say, hi, I'm up for a job and I put you down as a reference as we agreed. I'm going to give you the job description so you know what they're looking at. If they're going to check your job, uh, your references after you've had your job interview, I always would send another, you know, email going, hi, I had a really good interview with them. I think they may be going to contact you. I emphasize this in my interview. Um, I think they're looking for somebody with these skills. Can you emphasize that? And hopefully they will. Beware, every named person on your CV could be contacted. So just always know that, you know, if you've worked with somebody um, as a runner and, you know, there was a third AD involved, if they know, you know, the shooter, they know uh, the production, they're more than likely to contact them directly. If you're sending a covering email or letter, you know, always be really clear in the subject what you're what uh, you're applying for. So this is, you know, the key details, you know, uh, researcher role available now or I'm, you know, runner available now. Um, make sure that you cover, you know, why you're applying to this company. Uh, production companies are, you know, as thin skinned as the rest of us. So if you say, I really like that series that you have out at the moment on X, you know, I've been recommending it to my friends. I thought I would send you a CV. I'm just, you know, starting out in, in television and would be really uh, keen to, you know, work for a company like yours. Always make sure that you include when you're available. You know, as I said, don't send these out, you know, before you're about to embark on a four month, you know, trip or even a two week trip and make sure that they know how to contact you. Keep it short, nobody wants to read, you know, an essay in a covering email and keep it formal and professional. You know, quite often um, if people send me their CVs, I'm just gonna forward them if they haven't put anything embarrassing in it. So it's, you know, it's much quicker for me to forward a CV um, if it's, if, 
um, ra rather than actually download your CV and then sending it off again. Um, don't get lost in the system. As I said, make sure that you've saved your CV so I know your first name, last name, and when you've sent it to me. I'm not going to ask you any questions, but what I will say to you last and, and, and not least is make sure that you put on the very bottom is that this CV may be shared. Um, it's called the GDPR statement. So put this CV may be shared for employment purposes. And that means that I can if you send your CV to me, I can send it out to other people and talent managers will be able to keep it on file. If you have any questions, there's lots of information about there about television CVs. Make sure you're going to genuine television sites, um, including the RTS Futures, the RTS sites, and places like Screen Skills. And best of luck, everybody. Well, there's so many wonderful schemes that can help you make that first step into the industry, or if you've already got some experience to help you move forwards. Um, there's work experience and shadowing schemes, there's bursaries to help fund courses, there's trainee schemes, and uh, of course, close to my heart, there's apprenticeships where you mix learning on the job with working towards a qualification. I head up the editorial schemes at the BBC, so that's our apprenticeship and trainee programmes in television, radio and digital production, in journalism and in production management. At the BBC, we also have apprenticeships in business, engineering and technology. And right now we're recruiting 600 apprentices across 40 schemes over the next 12 months in lots of disciplines all over the BBC, from Jersey to the Shetland Islands and across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. In our news, sport, programme making, technical, IT, engineering and our business and administration departments. On a BBC apprenticeship, as well as working on the job as part of a team in production, in journalism, engineering, IT or business, you go to a learning provider where you will study towards a qualification. There's also gold standard training at the BBC, learning from our journalists, producers and technical experts. Some apprenticeships are entry level, so they're just right for people finishing their A-levels and looking to get into the media or career changers looking to move on. We also have higher level apprenticeships and trainee schemes, both degree level and postgraduate. So there's really something for everyone and at every level of experience. There's apprenticeships like these all over the industry with lots of broadcasters and indies. There's also bursaries. Um, the RTS run two bursary schemes. There's the technology bursary and the TV production and journalism bursary. They're designed to support people from lower income backgrounds to pursue a career in the television industry. As well as financial support, bursary recipients have free RTS membership, networking events and mentoring. The NCTJ, that's the National Council for the Training of Journalists, they run uh, the Journalism Diversity Fund, and that awards bursaries to people from diverse backgrounds who need funding for their NCTJ journalism training. There's various boot camp training schemes like the Mama Youth Project who offer courses in television production. And the Edinburgh TV Festival runs two talent schemes, the network focused at those trying to get into the industry. And for those with more experience, there's the Ones to Watch scheme. These are great schemes that include lots of masterclasses and workshops and mentoring. What's it like applying for these schemes? What do you have to do? What sort of questions do you need to fill in? Well, these are really varied um, in different companies, do it in different ways. At the BBC, most schemes have uh, around three questions and they're a mix of written and video answers. Um, very few schemes have any qualification requirements, though some require maths and English and you'll find details on the adverts. Our entrance level schemes at the BBC are all about potential. So we're not looking for lots of experience, but we are looking for passion. If you're looking at production or journalism apprenticeships, then maybe you've written blogs, made films that you've posted to social media, or worked on a school or college magazine or website. That's the sort of experience we love to hear about. In journalism, we might ask you about a local story that's interested you and your ideas about how to report it. Or in production, we could ask for a programme idea or for you to talk about the production area that interests you the most. In production management, we'll ask you questions that demonstrate your ability to plan and organise. So should you write a covering letter to explain why you're applying for the scheme. Well, again, this really depends on the individual scheme and what's been asked for in the advert.
For the schemes at the BBC, you answer questions through the website, but other companies or schemes might ask you to email them an outline, in which case I would advise writing a covering letter that sets out any criteria they've asked for in the advert and demonstrates your passion for the company, for the scheme and the type of role you're seeking. Are there any schemes that are specific to diverse talent? Yes, all the broadcasters and indies are working hard to develop a diverse workforce. Whilst most schemes are open to all, they particularly encourage applicants from diverse backgrounds. There are also some schemes that are specifically targeted at diverse talent, like the BBC's Extending News journalism programme that places people in newsrooms across the BBC. Also for journalists, the NCTJ, that's the National Council for the Training of Journalists, they run the Journalism Diversity Fund, which awards bursaries to people from diverse backgrounds who need funding for their NCTJ journalism training. So how do you stand out from other candidates on your application? Well, we want to see your passion and your potential. So think about how you can demonstrate that. If you can get work experience, that's great. But it doesn't have to be professional experience or on a formal scheme. If you want to be a journalist, then writing for your school or college magazine or website is really useful experience. Maybe reporting on sports you're interested in or with a charity or community media. For production, how about making your own films? Whether that's drama, documentaries, a news report, comedy, just make stuff on your phone. Download some free editing software and start teaching yourself. There's also so many resources online. Check out the BBC Academy website that includes loads of learning resources. If you want to work in production management, we'll want to know about your ability to plan and organise. So maybe you've been involved in setting up an event you can talk about. So how can you find out more information about talent schemes? Well, there's lots out there, so it does need a bit of research. Have a look around the different broadcasters and the indies. Look at people like Screen Skills and look at the RTS Futures website. For the BBC schemes, search BBC Careers for more information or type BBC Careers in your favourite search engine. Follow our social media at BBC Get In. You'll hear when our schemes launch, as well as details of events, webinars and loads of useful hints and tips. The best way to prepare for an interview, I would say, is do your research. I think that's so, so important. And a lot of I know it sounds very, very basic, but a lot of people do forget it. Do your research. Who are you meeting? Who Who's the company you're going to see? What do they produce? What what shows do they make? Um, having that those that foundation of knowledge going into an interview is very very impressive for the um, interviewer just to know that you're you know serious about the role serious about the company um, and it, it's it's just good sort of standard um, way to to approach any sort of interview is doing your research that's for sure um, with with any any interview any company you're going for um, and you know, it's it's just remembering that this is this is a first impression. So it's really it's really an important time for for in the recruitment process. You've presumably you know passed the application um, stage, which is amazing. You've done really well to obviously get an interview, but it's now your time to demonstrate who you are. So um, just think, you know, this is the first impression, and you really want to give off a good one. when you have your interview show passion show enthusiasm for the role um a willingness and eagerness to learn i think all of these are so important when you are um having any sort of interview it shows that you're you know you, you've got that passion and drive to want to do really well and i think that's really important in any interview in any field I get there you know 10-15 minutes early so you can kind of settle yourself you get a, an idea of your surroundings you know um, and it's it's just um, again it shows it's a very good sort of first um, first impression to show that you're there and you're serious um, about about the interview and about the roles so in an interview when you have finished you usually get asked to um if you have any questions and 
it depends on and how much you spoke and what you know what the interview was like but it's always good to come prepared with some questions at the end um that can you can ask you know anything that's kind of suitable for for that interview but you know anything specifically about the role that you'd like to ask for I think is perfectly acceptable to ask in the interview if there are any um, aspects of the role in the brief that you don't quite understand or want to hear a little bit more about um show them that you know you've read the brief you understand it if they're and, and just ask them a little bit about um the role itself I think that's a uh, really good practice um you know and it's your time also in an interview to uh, to find out about the company um as well as um sort of finding out about it's your time to find out about the company as well as them finding out about you so use that time if there's any questions ask the interviewer you know what do you enjoy most about working at the company you know something like that and it really gives you a good gauge of what um you know, why they like it why it's such a lovely working environment which essentially is what you're going to want to settle into so um you know use those those times when you get asked at the end of an interview of got any questions it's a good time for you to inquire about the company this uh, and the role itself if you're really nervous on the day and you don't feel like you asked all the questions or got what you could out of the interview rest assured it's per that's perfectly natural feeling because I, I i've done it many many times but always know you've probably done a lot better than what you what you think if you are thoroughly prepared um, if there are any questions that you, you know, wanted to follow up on that are about the role, I, you know, I, I think it's absolutely fine to um, reach out and say there was one question I was a little bit unsure about. Um, but I feel like if you feel like you haven't asked all the questions, just just remember they've asked you the questions they need to know. So if you've given well-rounded, well-researched answers, the the interview should be covered so try not to worry too much about that element of it um but if there are questions that you you know wanted to know about salary or the location or where you're going to be based um is it remote work and you know those sorts of questions are fine to to follow up on should you um have forgotten to ask them at the end of the interview um and that's perfectly reasonable to sort of reach out to the interviewer um after you finish the interview if you've got to um to ask at the end if you don't know an answer to a question you're being asked in an, in, in an interview, I always feel like it's perfectly fine to ask them what they mean. So rather than guessing and sort of ambling your way along, I feel like if they ask you in a, maybe in a different way, you will then understand the question. And that is absolutely fine. Um, I would personally always do that so I can understand what they mean um if they use this sort of terminology I don't quite understand um or something like that they might be able to rephrase it in a way that I do understand and therefore able to answer it correctly and and, and substantially um so don't don't feel um at, like you can't ask them to, to sort of repeat it and ask them what they mean that's absolutely fine um and yeah and that, that way you'll you'll be able to sort of prepare um yeah it that way you'll be able to answer the the question um once you kind of understood it i think leaving an interview as sort of you know it's your lasting impression isn't it so it's um i, I would always thank them for their time i would um you just appreciate sort of being asked for an interview and show your kind of appreciation um it's all very you know well good manners and and polite um and politeness go such a long way um and i feel like that at, at an end of an interview if you if you do that it's your lasting impression so um you know and always leave with a smile i think that's very important um is is you know a smile also goes a, a long way um in in especially working in sort of tv production and things um especially when you're kind of starting out but i feel like um that's a really good way and it's you know your lasting in impression of an interview Obviously, you're keen for the role, which 
is great, which is really good. Um, they would, you would have seen on the um, the application a closing date, I'm sure. So I would let that pass um, and just ensure, and, and you would have had a conversation potentially in your interview as well with when, how, you know, that when are they meeting people, how long the interview process is, is going on for. So you'll gauge that information ahead of time. Um, and once that's passed, I feel like it's absolutely fine to sort of do a follow up um, uh, email. Um, it shows you're, you know, you are keen, but um, I wouldn't necessarily do it the next day. <laughs> For example, um, but it's it certainly does show you're passionate about the role. So just give give it a little bit of time because the selection process can sometimes be um, quite a long one. I remember a time when I had um, someone come into an interview room. I was doing the interview, and they they bought with them. Um, a uh, sort of an array of color coded labels, highlighters. They came fully because we were doing a task within that interview and they came fully prepared with a whole box of stationery, which I personally <laughs> thought was genius and I thought was brilliant, um, as well as a notebook to take any notes. Um, it just really shows a kind of um, extra that people go in an extra mile really again really being passionate and caring about the role they're applying for um, and it, it was a, a long lasting impression um, first impressions um there's such a long way in an interview um and uh yeah i'm i was personally very very impressed with that i think when people come to an interview not prepared not understanding what the role is, not do, having done their research, um, not knowing really what the company is, the shows we make. Um, I just feel like that's really basic research you can do before any interview. And if that's not done, I sort of, I uh, that is a little bit disappointing because it's, it's very easy to do. There's a lot of information out there now on the internet that you can source and find out and it doesn't take too long at all. So there's no real excuse to not being prepared in that respect. So, um, I, you know, I, I've had a couple of interviews in the past where that has happened, um, which is a real shame because they so showed, showed so much promise in um, in the application stage. So, um, yeah, that, that I suppose that is a little bit disappointing. My top tips would be um, be prepared, do your research, be enthusiastic, be passionate, have a smile on your face because first impressions really, really do count. Um, and once you have your knowledge of the, the company and the role going into the interview, you'll feel super confident um, and that will come across in your interview to the employer as well. So it's it's really, really important. Um, and just a willingness a, a willingness to to learn and um, and and develop, I think is is really, really crucial um, going into any interview. I think there's a few different things that you can do, um, but I think one of the most important things is to try and have a bit of strategy, not to be too scattergun, because you know there's lots of different kinds of programs, lots of different production companies, lots of different channels. So I think the first thing I would always suggest to people is watch lots of telly, work out what you like, what you think you'd like to make, and do your research find out who the production companies are that make those shows, look up the people that uh, are on the credits and start making a strategic list of um, those companies and those people. Well, actually, I think one of the most important things that I think is a total no-no is don't make the mistake of writing a standard form email that you circulate to lots of different companies. I think the most important thing is that you make sure that your email is targeted to the particular company or the particular show that you're interested in. So yes, do write to the email 
on the company website or if the company website has a talent manager or an executive producer that you know makes one of the shows that you're interested in write to that person and give a bit of detail as to why you're writing specifically to them or to that company um, and about the show or the shows that you're interested in working on. Never underestimate the value of networking, not just with people who can employ you, but with your peers, because um, there's lots and lots of social media groups out there and networking events. And one of the really good and useful ways to find out about work or companies or people to talk to is to have conversations and keep in the loop, keep in WhatsApp groups and so on with your peers. They are gonna be your most valuable resource. Don't underestimate it. It's mm. not just about getting to know the bosses. Talk to people. It's talk to people who are already doing those jobs, working for those companies. Find out as much as you can. It's not easy to get a job in television, you know, particularly a first job in television. So it's not that easy to just sort of jump in and try things out. So the most important thing you can do is go out there and have conversations with people. What I would say is what sort of things do you like to watch? I think that's a really good place to start. Um, if you're obsessed with things like Steph's packed lunch or this morning, perhaps daytime programming and the um, live is something you'd like to go to go for and be interested in. Um, if you're whenever you have a bit of spare time, if you're going through Netflix and you're looking at all the reality programming, then that's another thing that you might be. I, I always think if you can have your passion, it's a very wonderful industry that we work in. Um, and I always think the best way to go is to work in something that you feel passionate about and that's something that you watch. So just have a look at the way you watch things, be it on iPlayer or Netflix. Are you always there to watch the news? And then just kind of step back a bit and think, why, why do I like this? I'd say the big thing that connects everybody um, in terms of whether it's factual programming or drama, I think is an interest in telling stories. That's at the heart of absolutely everything we do. You've got to have a passion and a love for telling stories, whether they're mm. you know, true stories or works of fiction. But I think more specifically, in the case of uh, unscripted, I would say that if you're interested in programs in what's called the specialist factual area, which includes things like science, art and history, I think if you have an academic background in that area, it can be quite helpful because often you're going to be spending your time reading technical books and technical papers, calling up experts at universities and having conversation with them, conversations with them. So, you know, you've you've got to have an interest and feel confident working in that space. Um, if you're working in areas like factual entertainment, where, you know, things like Love Island, where it's all about the people, then um, I think that's a slightly different set of skills. You know, it's really about, um, you know, what makes a good uh, television character and how do you find them and how do you assess them? Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to say was um, if you're somebody who's interested in documentary and things like the Tinder Swindler, that is all about having really good journalistic skills and getting access to people and places that are hard to reach. Most television companies and individuals who are looking at CVs get sent many CVs every day, and they will probably only spend a few seconds looking at your CV in the first instant before they decide that they want to spend time digging a bit deeper. It's a hard but brutal truth that basically the most important thing is that your CV is clear. Um, I've seen lots of CVs in my time where people have got sort of gimmicks and pictures and used crazy fonts because they want to stand out. But the reality is that 
if you make your CV hard to read because it's full of, full of gimmicks and tricks, you may not be doing yourself a favor. You need to have real clarity and you need to have lots of bullet points. You need to keep in your mind that you need that CV very quickly to tell the people looking at it who you are and what it is you want. Clarity. Clarity and bre brevity. Is that a word? Brevity. Um, talent managers are, the, are your key person to um, approach with a CV at any production company or any broadcaster. And they are very busy people. This is nothing to do with you or your ability, but um, they get an awful lot of CVs in for certain jobs. So your CV has to stick out and has to be readable and to be clear um, quickly. So there's a kind of general rule of thumb, I say, where you have a quite a short CV, you know, maximum of two pages or even a, a sort of entry level one page. Please look at your email address, your Gmail address. Fluffy3 at gmail.com is fine perhaps when you've been a student, but it's not the best approach for your professional career going forward. At the top of a CV, if you have anything that you've done um, at, at university or college that you can put onto a website, a link to a website is great. Um, and then a, a few lines very briefly about the kind of role that you're looking for. Um, you don't just have one CV. I think that's the top tip. You can have many different CVs compared, just comparing to what you want to, want, what role you want to go for. I think that there's a real balance with covering letters. I think they are useful if there is something that you want to say that's not in your CV, or you want to draw particular attention to something in your CV that is specific to a job that you're applying for, or that relates specifically to the company that you want to get to know. But your CV should be doing most of the hard work and very lengthy cover, covering letters probably won't get read properly. So I think a covering letter is good, but try and keep it to the point. Don't just go over everything that's in your CV. Think very hard about why you're writing the covering letter and what it is you want to say. Do your homework. Do your homework, so important. Read up about the company. Read up about the people that work there. If you're going for an interview for a specific job, I know this is an obvious thing to say, but make sure that either you've watched the show, if it's a returning series, or that you've had a conversation with someone who can give you as much information as possible about what the show is. I think that's the most important thing. You know, make sure that you have done your homework. Always come armed with a couple of questions to ensure that everybody in the room knows that you've been thinking about it you've been thinking about what you're going to say what you want to know demonstrate your passion and your love for television you'd be surprised how many times I'd sat in interviews with people and I said and I say well what are you watching at the moment what do you like to watch and there's complete silence people can't even think and sometimes it's because they're nervous but sometimes it's because actually they haven't really been watching that much telly so go away watch some telly and think about what you love Please research where you're going. Double check um, an office. The, the office on the website might be three years old and it might not be where you're meeting. So make sure you know who you're meeting and um, what time the meeting is and get there early. Get a seat, have a glass of water, take your coat off, turn your phone off and just prepare. Get somebody else to have a look at it and take out all the waffle. Um, spell check is always great. Please spell things correctly. Um, and that's it. Don't go on for pages and pages. If it says 500 words, make sure it is 500 words. If it says a page of A4, do it in a decent sized font, and not a tiny, tiny, tiny font. Clarity and just, I, I, I would do it like an essay and answer the question, each, each stage of the things that they're looking for, mirror it in, in your experience. I don't think you do necessarily need to have a degree to work in TV. I think it completely depends on what job you're interested in. But even then, it's not a prerequisite. I think that if you have an interest in working on 
specialist factual television, which which is all about, you know, stories about science and science research and natural history and art history. Um, it can certainly help and be a little bit of a shorthand if you are used to reading big academic texts and talking to academic experts, but not it's not a definite, it just helps, I think. Um, but for example, if you're interested in becoming an editor, there are courses that you can take. You know, you certainly don't need a degree if you want to be an editor, uh, an editor for example. And I think that um, if you are interested in working on shows where there's a big cast of ordinary people, you know, people skills are really important they're really important um they probably trump a degree for sure i don't think so anymore no i think i think um a long time ago it was preferable um <clears throat> but um i think experience along the way is is absolutely um essential and it's, it's the way that you use your experiences if you've been writer if you're going for a sort of writing role or a, like a writer's assistant type role <coughs> the fact that you've been writing all your life is is, is fine um it, i suppose it depends what you go for uh, traditionally perhaps um a degree was necessary to get you along the line um i think that's changing so i think experience along um, along the way in in the areas that you're looking at it can very much get you in the door so don't be perturbed by that or don't let that stop you I'm going to let you into a secret. Um, I am in my mid 40s and I've literally only just passed my driving test. Now, admittedly, that was because I live in the city. I live in uh, London and I haven't needed to. Um, I also don't work in scripted. So if you work in scripted um, or if you want to work in film, you're probably going to need to pass your test, not necessarily have a car, but you will need to be able to drive. Um, this is because a lot of the time, the productions are actually situated outside of somewhere where you can get public transport to them. So you need to be able to get to the place where your place of work is. However, working in unscripted, so things like documentaries or factual or uh, sometimes sports as well, lots of different types of shows, um, often are in places that are much more easily accessible by public transport, often in bigger cities and towns as well. And it may even be that you work in a department where you're mostly office based or perhaps a hybrid working from home so you don't actually have to drive. Um, I would probably recommend maybe not leaving it quite as long as me. I've worked in telly for 25 years, so um, I probably should have learned to drive a little bit before now, but you know, no time like the present. It's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I think um, production companies and particularly broadcasters are um, very much holding on to this. I used to work for a company called Screen Skills. And there's a really lovely lady there who set up a mentor mentee scheme, which they run on an annual basis, actually, in her job in her little office there is to match. Match people to match um mentor find mentors and then find the mentee i think that's the right word to go with them so um keep an eye out on the screen skills website because they look for people all the time but go back to your course or the things that you have done the experience so far and just again rather like trying to find out what you feel passionate about you've kind of got to take a step back and look at the contacts that you have got already perhaps you were lucky enough to get some work experience um along with your studying or in you know if you were working with a director or something have a have a think about objectively how how well you got on with that person and then just reconnect with them it's quite scary but you, i'm sure you'll have a mobile number for them um or even an email and send them a message saying hi it's fiona here and um, we work together i'm just wondering i'm wondering if, if i could possibly have your your email and then just send them just to, just say you know I, I've graduated now or I'm looking for work now I'd, I'd really appreciate um 
a couple of minutes of your time. I don't know if you're going to be around soon or what. And then try and get a, a meeting with them. And I will guarantee that whoever you're speaking to will be very flattered and feel how, how nice that was to be thought, thought of in that way and do as much as they can. I'm sure you'll get a coffee, you might even get a chat. So one of the first things I would say to do is find your Facebook account again. I know that's scary and boring and old school, but Facebook is a way that most talent managers work. Um, and there's lots of different groups on Facebook. There's a, there's a Facebook group for runners. There's a Facebook group in the north of England, um, any roles outside of the M25 called TV Talent North, and they're absolutely fantastic. There's a company called Screen Skills, which is a charity um, they run at different times of the year, um, all sorts of different early entry level schemes. You can get on their mailing list and find out about those. They're not just London centric. They can they often have bases in Leeds or Manchester, um, as well as Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland now. And there are bursaries available for you to go do that or else it might be online. So that's another one. Sometimes it can be really difficult to know what you should be paid, but there's a few easy tricks, or sorry, tips even, uh, that you can use. So the first one is ask other people. So it's really good idea to try and befriend your production manager or line producer. They'll be able to share with you the kind of range of um, salary that you can expect. You can also look online as well. There are some resources, one that I would recommend having a little look at, which is free. And you don't have to be a member, it's actually um, the Entertainment Union, BEC2, B-E-C-T-U, if you have a little look for their rate negotiations or rate cards, depending on what job you're doing, there will be um, a little guide for you, which will give you the bare basic of what you should be paid sort of for the first day in that job. Um, and then you can uh, look to build upon that. But I would just have conversations with people about what you should expect to be paid. You might be surprised. You might be slightly undercutting yourself. If you want to think about a career in television when you've had another kind of career and you want to make sure that people understand that you can take those skills and put them into television. I think the first thing you've got to do is you've got to have a conversation with a few different people working in TV and you've got to ask them, okay, what are the five skills you think that are needed for a particular kind of job? And then you've got to think about the job you're doing at the moment and think, okay, do I actually have any of those skills? So um, take Love Island as an example, you know, that is going to be, all about or any of those shows where there are a lot of ordinary people in them you know it's going to be all about um making a good connection with ordinary people and you know um you know helping them feel comfortable and relaxed and talking to them and um you know, there's lots of different kinds of jobs outside television where that is a prerequisite. You know, for example, if you are a waitress or if you work um, in an office for an estate agent, you know, or if you work in a flower shop, you know, all of those jobs, you know, um, dealing with people, making them feel comfortable is all absolutely part of it. And then lots of jobs in television, it's really important to manage um, a budget. And there are lots of jobs outside television where managing a budget, dealing with money is really, really important. So, so in a nutshell, I would say, talk to people already working in television and get them to break down for you what are the top five skills that you need and then think yourself, what am I doing now that connects with that? And I think that's, that's, that's the way you can prove to the employers that you've got the baseline skills that you need. Again, I go. I always go back to to screen skills. They do they do sort of transitional courses. Depends really what you want to do. There are kind of lots of side steps. I mean, I'm a talent manager now, but I used to work in, and I still do actually. I work in on screen talent, um, and I sort of sidestepped into into talent management um, off the back of that. And then casting is another thing, and they're sort of grouped, so you can kind of do a sort of left or right change depending on, on what you want to do but if you want to go from a director to being a producer that's um uh, you know you, you can sometimes do that on specific projects where you can be um a director producer 
Or <clears throat> if you do want a completely different change in, in tack, you have to be prepared if you can do that financially, because quite often you will have to take a step back to, to move forward in a new direction. Um, and again, this, this lovely place, Screen Skills, um, offers amazing training courses. So you can you can have maybe been a, a director for a while, but you're wanting to eventually move towards commissioning, for example. And there are commissioning schemes that you can apply for, which will take you through that process and you'll be mentored through and work on different productions. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy to do, but, you know, if you're up for challenge and you're very passionate about it, there are there are ways of doing it. But I think, as I say, um, it's it's often easy to see the changes when you're in a job already. Networking is a really key part of working in television because television programs are made by groups of people. They're not made by individuals. They're made by teams of people. And so that feeling that you're connecting with people and in the room with people is really, really important. That is the way that great telly gets made. But, you know, it's it's something that doesn't necessarily come naturally to everybody. And, you know, lots of people have spent lots of time um, in front of their computer screens and it might be something that's quite new for them. So I think the thing about successful networking is, you know, be kind to yourself because it's something that comes with confidence. And, you know, I, I said earlier, you know, don't underestimate the importance of connecting with your peers. So I would say start, start small, start small, start with a couple of people that you feel confident talking to and grow it from there because it's a small world telly and before too long, you'll suddenly find that two people that you've connected with working at two different production companies will have met another three people each. And before you know it, you know, you, you've spread, you've spread your networking to 20 companies and 50 people. And it happens very, very organically, but just be kind to yourself and start slow. But the most important thing is, you know, it doesn't happen in front of a computer screen. You know, you have, you have to go and do these things in person if you can, but everyone's as nervous as you, you're no different. It goes back to my original question of what you like to watch yourself really and where you are in the country um if you are based in london um there are an awful lot of networking events that you can you can try and apply to um again it's just being part of the whole sort of system remember i said about the facebook groups there are an awful lot of things um advertised there um so you sort of have a look at the the production companies that are near are near to you um and you can you can you can go in and say I'd love to say, come in and say hello and introduce myself. And if part of a talent manager's job is to make sure that they are supporting new talent, and that's one way to go. Um, there are more and more of these meet and greets that are happening. And the best way to really network um, is get your, <laughs> your big girl pants on and look back at the people that you've already got a connection with, and that's a that's a good start go back through the people that you already know and you'll be surprised at who who you made a connection with and the best way to network is to start off and, and to reach out to them again have a coffee have a phone call remember people are busy and it's not all about you and it's nothing personal if they don't get back uh, but it's also okay to reach out again and I think that's the best start to, to network is to look at the people that you've you know you already know uh, so the uh, I would say uh, let me start there again. That's okay. Also, right sat next to the thing, making it wobble. <laughs> um, I would say there's a couple of ways to get your next job. The first thing is to be really good at the job that you've actually been hired to do, um, so that people build trust in you, your abilities. They understand that you can do the job. You follow instructions. That just makes you a really trustworthy member of the team. So um, it means that people would like to take you on to their other jobs. So sometimes you don't even have to look for the next one. People are going to be looking for you. Um, another tip is to let people know that you're looking. If you don't share with people that you are looking for your next job, 
then employers often just imagine that you're already busy and working. So make sure that you're reaching out to people, whether it's sending uh, text messages or on WhatsApps or in groups, just reminding people that you're available, uh, put it on your socials as well. Just let people know that you're around, really.